Um, so thank you all for coming. Thank you to people online as well. Um, it's quite an attendance, which is nice to see. Um, so just a few Zoom housekeeping slides. Um, thank you to our corporate members. Um, we have a whole bunch there. And thank you all. High size, total seismic, bell size, dub, transparent earth, geophysics, Santos, and Southern Geoscience. And um, GBG is our New South Wales sponsor. Oh, there we go. And there's all the South Australia, Northern Territory sponsors, and Western Australia. Um, so if you have a question, um, you can type it into your Q&A at home. And then over here, we'll have people, um, we'll have people asking questions and Hopefully the people online will be able to hear. Um, upcoming webinars. So there's one on the 23rd of March, um, one on the 30th, and then the 6th of April and the 7th. And all the details will be sent to everyone shortly. And our next meeting here will be on the 21st. Um, if you haven't already become a member, there's a whole range of benefits. One of the most topical being um, you get a discount for the upcoming AEGC conference in Brisbane. Um, keep in touch with all the social media and um, the extended abstracts are now open for AEGC. The deadline is on 29th of March, which is at the end of this month. Um, thanks again to GBG. And now our president, Jim, will introduce Peter. That's not the first slide. <laughs> okay, so after that minor hiccup. Um, so welcome to uh, our special St. Patrick's Day edition. Um, I wasn't really sure what I was going to say tonight um, because peter has uh, he's been around for a while. And he's done uh, just about everything a man could do in our field. Uh, but then I stumbled across an article entitled Peter Gunn Remembers His Life as a Geophysicist, History, Adventure, Romance, Hydrocarbon and Mineral Discoveries, Amazing Mathematics and Tectonic Theories, Social Commentary and a Happy Ending. <laughs> and I won't go into the happy endings part, um, but needless to say, um, the article has made my job much easier. Um, and I encourage you all to read it uh, if you get a chance. So Peter grew up in Western Victorian town of Balmoral, which at the time had no electricity. He studied physics at Melbourne University in the mid 60s and ended up doing an extra year in geophysics. After working for BHP for a few years, he took up a generous MSc opportunity at Melbourne University, um, which included, uh, and he wrote this, an office, access to a 32-bit computer, no less, invitations to faculty sherry parties and enough money to pay for an apartment and a wife. Um, and I think that's a feat that's probably only possible at a handful of regional universities these days. Um, after his MSc, um, BHP wanted him back, but the, he couldn't work there while he had a beard. Um, so he ended up in the oil and gas game on the Northwest Shelf. Um, he went to Manitoba to do his PhD um, in 68, but that didn't work out. So he ended up learning more about geology. And he spent time in the Canadian survey with Geoterex and then did a PhD at Durham in 1970. Did a postdoc with CSIRO and the University of Adelaide in 72, then the Victorian Geological Survey till 75. And then for the next 15 years, he worked all around the world with um, Elf Aquitaine, eventually becoming the chief petroleum geophysicist. He's worked at Geoscience Australia um, in the late 90s um, and then became a consultant. Uh, and that's when I met, I met uh, Peter during that phase of his career about 10 years ago. Um, so from Balmoral in Victoria, he's been all over the world plying his craft. Uh, he's now living at Balmoral in Sydney. Um, he's pretty much retired, enjoying electricity, running water and spectacular views of Sydney Harbour. <laughs> Uh, it's quite a journey, and can you please all welcome Peter Gunn. That, thank you, Jim. That wasn't too bad. Some people have written uh, resumes of me and got it completely wrong, but anyway, that was, that was fairly good. I was just condensing that. <laughs> okay. Um, so while that was going on, I hope you were able to 
read everything I'm promising you in, the, in this introductory slide, but um, I, don't, I don't think I just need to read these things. I'll, they'll become evident as we go, go through. Just in case any of you here don't know where Broken Hill is, here's a Aramag image of uh, New South Wales showing where Broken Hill is. And I've downloaded a few mineral occurrences. You can see all these lead ones clustering around Bro Broken Hill here. Uh, Broken Hill uh, is an area. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry about that. Broken Hill is located in the area of complex uh, proterozoic geology, mainly proterozoic geology, in, in a, 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 a unit known as the Kernamona Crater. Now we're getting to the serious part of the of the talk. Uh, here, I have a gravity image with gravity contours of the Broken Hill area. Now you can see, oh, oh yeah, okay, the, the mouse is working. You can see there are actually two big gravity anomalies and a, a little one down, down to the south. This, this, this will form the basis of my talk. And what is really, really striking about this image is all these occurrences of the silver, lead and zinc cluster around the edges of the gravity anomalies. That is very, very significant. And I'll be showing some reasons why that is so. Now, the bloke, Broken Hill area has been recognized as rift by many workers, including Barney, wherever you are, Barney. And uh, Ian, Ian Plymer was a rift man as well, but I haven't been able to track down his paper. Uh, now, I, I, I'm going to base my talk on my work I've been doing in various rifts around the world, in particular in the context of hydrocarbon exploration. It's, it's quite possible that um, uh, some mineral geologists aren't terribly familiar with the, the sedimentary rifts. Now, the Broken Hill ore body contained over 200 million tonnes of ore, and this, the main line of loads about 17.5 kilometers long. That's this is the main the main economic deposits along here, but there are all these other uh, occurrences and uh, exploration is still going on in, in, in these areas that they may hit significant ore, ore bodies as well. Uh, there's a company uh, called Silver City Minerals. I, I, I'm actually a shareholder. They gave me some in their float and they are have been exploring up here hoping that the trend's going to continue, but they haven't quite cracked it yet. Now, here we have a, a gravity, uh, I mean, a geological map of Broken Hill. It's, it's so detailed, uh, you won't be able to um, make, make much uh, detail out, but I'd just like to say that um, uh, the Thackeringa, Broken Hill and Sundown groups have been interpreted as synrift sediments. I'll explain in my next slide what I mean by synrift. And up here is a bit of post-rift sediments. That's, that's after, after rift stopped um, spreading and it's starting to sag. And down at the bottom, we have some uh, outcrops of thor uh, uh, thor Thorndale composite gneiss, which are an important part of the story I'll, I'll come back to later on. And you can see these major shear zones. Uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be giving explanations of possible or, origins for these major shear zones later on. So let, let's, uh, I'll explain uh, rifts as I understand them. Uh, you, you get uh, continental extension and uh, you, you get uh, cr crustal thinning and, and uh, the, the mantle comes close to the surface and you get a bit of a depression and you get sort of uh, uh, various sediments, commonly fluvatile or lacustrine sediments in the shallow depression. And as the extension goes on, the, the uh, poor old crust cracks and, and the, 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 you know, the area over the extension drops down and that's when you get a classic rift. And the sediments in here, uh, 
but what are known as sinrift sediments. And the extension is um, allowed by major faulting and various internal faulting. And what a lot of people don't uh, uh, appreciate that if the extension goes far enough, the, the crustal thinning is such that the mantle rises up and it, it comes up like this. There's a bit of discussion between various people. I, I personally think what happens as the mantle gets close to the surface, it decompresses and sort of turns, turn, produces an intrusion. Now, the, the, these uh, central rift intrusions are very, very important in a lot of cases. Now, the original aeromagnetic interpretation of the, the Bass Basin and the Gippsland Basin interpreted some big magnetic anomalies, uh, and which were quite deep down. And I said the basins are there, but actually uh, they, they were these um, mid-crustal intrusions. Anyway, as the extension goes on, uh, what happens? The, 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 the rift splits down the middle and uh, you get sort of a, a proto-oceanic crust or oceanic crust developed between the halves of the intrusion. These intrusions are split in part. And I'll, I'll be showing examples of where that's happened. And if the extension goes on, you get one side of the rift with the intrusion on, uh, on, on the edge of a continental margin. Now, if, if the rift uh, doesn't, doesn't extend very far, it, 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 you get a failed rift. And then what happens, uh, the, the mantle cools, gets denser and shrinks and subsides. And, and you get all of the original rifts, uh, sin rift sediments are covered, covered by the sag zone. And another thing, which I'll, I'll be uh, explaining much more in detail later, very often rifts uh, get squashed and you, you have, uh, you know, for various tectonic reasons, they get squashed and you get the whole rift or the sediments pops up and you know, it, it, it rises up. I'll be coming back to that late, later on. That's called the basin inversion. Now, what a lot of people don't fully understand that rifts actually can, can have different amounts of extension along, along the length of the rift. Uh, so the most developed part of the rift I show, show up here where, where, where you've sort of got ocean crust between two halves of the original rift and that's where the central intrusion is, is starting to split and then the less developed part of the rift you just get sometimes you get lines of intrusions along the axis of the rift which sometimes they coalesce in, into one long intrusion then, then you get parts of the rift with, without any intrusion underneath whatsoever. This, uh, the right-hand slide just shows, it's too complicated to explain in this talk, but uh, the, di the different uh, degrees of extension, you get you know, different amounts of crustal thinning, you get different amounts of intrusion and so forth, and you, you get a whole lot of different signatures along the axis of the rift. And here's, here's a list of a few of the basins <coughs> around the world where I, I kind of, this model I've given you actually, actually applies fairly easily. There's a lot more where I, I haven't worked and I've, I just read about them. But now what I, I'm going, uh, not all rifts conform exactly to the model that I, I showed you, but uh, I, 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 think, I think the Broken Hill area uh, uh, corresponds to uh, the Joseph Bonaparte Gulf Rift where I've done a lot of, lot of work. Now, the, the Joseph Bonaparte Gulf Rift, uh, it's up, up here in uh, uh, Northwestern Australia. I think you can locate it there, but what is really, really striking about the Jonas, Joseph Bonaparte Rift is it has this big axial gravity anomaly in the guts of it down the south, and further up north, the gravity anomaly splits into two different prongs. You see, there's, there's, there's a gravity anomaly. And uh, I'm about to, about to show you a lot of detailed studies uh, over this gravity anomaly, which have been done by various academics and, and Geoscience Australia. And I, I think, that, which basically, I believe confirms my model. Now, here we are 
we start off at, at, down in the south of the rift where it's um, less developed, but it's still, still got this big gravity anomaly. Here, here's a, 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 a slide or a, a, a figure taken from Stephanie Baldwin's PhD a thesis. And she's used the very good seismic data in the area to actually figure out the, the layers that you, that you can see the, the deep sedimentary trough down the guts of the rift. But underneath, you, you, you can see that the, the, the mantle's coming up and, and it causes this big gravity anomaly. And just um, this is uh, away from the Bonaparte rift a little bit. It's uh, some images from the AFAR Triangle. The AFAR Triangle is um, at the junction of the Red Sea, the Arabian Sea, and, and the, the top of, of the East African rift system. Basically, what, what's happened here, there was a mantle plume. This is well accepted in the literature. Mantle plumes are where big bubbles of magma come up from, I don't know, the core mountain boundary or the base of the lithosphere. They, they dome, dome up the, the land and, and the, the poor old like, the surface gets so stretched you, you get cracks and they, they typically form three prongs. And here you can see uh, uh, one, one of the prongs. So this is the onshore part of the AFAR triangle. You, you can see it's how, how it split apart and, and the East African rift is starting to propagate down here. Uh, the, the, these authors have identified a whole lot of axial intrusions down, down the uh, guts of the the East African rift system, and they've actually done seismic tomography over the area. This is a plan view of some of their seismic tomographic images. Uh, seismic tomography is where you have a whole lot of explosion, a whole lot of receivers, and that you measure the travel time between the explosion and the various receivers. And you set up a big matrix and you solve a whole lot of simultaneous equations, and you can figure out the velocities and depths of layers. And they've actually identified a whole lot of these actual intrusions shown here in red. And they, they, that's, that's planned and they've taken cross section. So a cross section across this one, you can see you can see an intrusion com coming up and a cross section between the two things, uh, uh, you can, there's no intrusion. Now here you've, they, they've got a whole line of separate intrusions. I just want to throw in that in the Sydney uh, Bowen Basin, which is a long skinny lift, it doesn't seem to have gone to this excess spreading, but you've got a, there's a, a, an axial gravity anomaly extending from basically Wollongong up to the middle of Queensland called the Meandara gravity anomaly. And it, it's really interesting because uh, uh, the, the, the gra Meandara gravity anomaly is <coughs> not just one single linear anomaly, it's a whole lot of separate culminations which are logically separated by transfer faults and they they all have their different sag histories. So there are different isopacks from various formations over the, um, the, the gravity highs. Now, this, this is probably the, the key slide of my talk. So here we are back at the the Bonaparte Basin, where we've, the gravity anomaly is bifurcated. Remember that down here, it's just a single gravity anomaly, but up here, um, it's split into two, uh, there would have been a transfer fault through here. And what we've got, so here's another one of Stephanie Baldwin's images using gravity modeling. And, and she, she's showing these two separate culminations. Uh, what's even better is this top, top slide in a way, because it's, it's a combination of deep seismic reflection and seafloor seismic tomographic imaging done by Alexei Goncharov of uh, Geoscience Australia. So basically, I'll show you the seismic section later on, but you know, you, you, you've got the, 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 the sag, of, you know, that, that's the rift in there with all, all the sediments, but coming up underneath it, the, the mantle's coming up at, at these two separate culminations. And these culminations are magnetic here. This is only a, a single magnetic profile where the inclination is 45 degrees. So uh, it's 
it's a bit distorted, but it, it's I, I believe I, I believe it's, it's showing that these features are magnetic. Now, ba basically, the, the key thing in this figure is that, that these I like to call them intrusions. So some people say just the mantle coming up, but something's coming up, and it, it, it's kind of dislocating the rocks above on its way up, and you've got these major faults. You, you'll see them on the size of exception next. These major faults going right down to, to, to the moho. And, and this, this thing would be pretty hot anyway. So you, you've got all these faults which could, could be tapping something down at the moho and the whole system is being heated up. And I, I, I'll, I'll keep coming back to that, but I think at Broken Hill where, where the silver lead zinc ore bodies are around the, the edges, of the, of the gravity highs, I, I, I think they've come up with some equivalent of, of these faults that, that you've got here. Uh, so it's interesting that the you, you get faults at the front and faults at the back of it, the intrusions and of the, and of the gravity high. This this other intrusion doesn't, which hasn't come up as far, doesn't seem to be creating so many faults. So. Here we have uh, the Goncharov section, and uh, this, this is some a deep seismic reflection section that's been produced by Geoscience Australia, and uh, you know, which, which they, they based these faults on. Just, just the record, I published a paper in 1988 and predicting that section there. Um, now, here, we're back at Broken Hill, and here is a, a gravity model I've produced across. You know, we've got two gravity anomalies at Broken Hill, and I'm going to say that these these are split, just 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 like in the Bonaparte Gulf. Um, at, at the time, by the time I did this modelling, I didn't have access to model vision anymore, and Kate Hine is a fairly well-known geophysicist. Let me access her, her modeling package re remotely. So uh, anyway, I might have done better with modeling because I was more used to modeling. Uh, okay. So anyway, this this is this is just a a, a summary of what, what I've been telling you before. I, I think that. Faults like these uh, are occurring ar around the edges of the intrusion, the two intrusions that have broken hill, and they've act acted as kind of um, uh, places where, where the uh, lead zinc mineralization ha has been deposited. Uh, just uh, up, oh, uh, go on. Now, my experience, most mostly um, these axial intrusions are magnetic, but the, the Broken Hill area corresponds to a, a big magnetic low, and the, the, the surface rocks in, around Broken Hill are, are quite magnetic. It's a, a bit of a mystery uh, what what causes this magnetic low. It's it, it, it's it's really deep because it's kind kind of broad, but um, unfortunately. Uh, this is this is one of the uh, deficiencies of my talk. I haven't tried to, to model this deep magnetic anomaly. There's several possibilities for it. It may, it may, it may be that um, there's a gabbro intrusions down there, which are just not magnetic, which sometimes happens with gabbro intrusions. Uh, the intrusions could be reversely magnetized, or there's been a lot of uh, high dense, uh, high grade metamorphism in the area, so maybe the Metamorphism has destroyed the, these rocks at depth, depth and uh, so, uh, what? Number three. Do you think metamorphism? Okay, well, there's, there's a, a jump at the CSO. <laughs> uh, okay, before, before I go and explain the location of the copper mineralization at Broken Hill, I just want to Go, go back to the Joseph Bonaparte Gulf because this is probably one of the better images I've got it. 
I did a lot of work in the Joseph Bonaparte Gulf, and in 1989, uh, I did an interpretation which was drilled, and it caused the first oil, oil flow in the Bonaparte Gulf with Barnett 2. And Barnett 2 is on a structure right in the middle, middle of, of the rift, which is con conceivably related to this ax axial dike. And down, down here on, on, on shore, I, I did, uh, well, there's a, a ridge of protozoic quartzite called the Pinkham Inlier. And I did a lot of exploration around there and I found a couple of lenses of uh, Mississippi Valley type uh, mineralization on the flanks of the Pinkham Inlier. But also in 1975, I modeled the magnetic field over the Pinkham Inlier and it was sitting right over uh, a ridge of magnetic rock. So I think, I think that, that could have been the, uh, the onshore continuation of, of, of this rift system. Oh, anyway, the, the copper. Okay, now here are the copper occurrences at Broken Hill, which um, by and large lie over the tops of the gravity anomalies. Remember, the lead zinc was around the edge. Now, <coughs> excuse me. For various reasons, I believe that these gravity anomalies are caused by um, <coughs> matic rocks, which, which became effectively intrusions. Now, get, get, getting back <coughs> to the area of the upper triangle, they, the interpretation there are that all of these segments have, have uh, a volcano, volcanic rocks underneath them, you know, so basically as in, in this, this stage of rifting. So uh, I, I, I think that the gravity anomalies at the Broken Hill, uh, which are covered with uh, copper occurrences, were probably effectively, were cut, well, uh, had volcanoes or intrusive bases, and I think the copper is coming from those. And also, one of my reasons for thinking that these intrusions are uh, mafic rocks, here, here are some outcrops of amphibolite. And you can see, particularly this big gravity anomaly is covered with amphibolite. So I would say these are uh, basic dikes arising from mafic or basic rocks at depth. And out in the Pacific, you have these ore bodies um, uh, or mineralization called black smokers. And here's an example from a paper by Bins of the CSRO it's showing how, how in a rift in, in the Pacific, uh, they, there's an intrusion and you know, the, 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 fl the fluids arriving from this intrusion come pre precipitate on the seafloor and, and are evidenced by these black smokers, which is Kind of particles full of, full of mineralization. So I just, I just wonder if similar venting has, has caused these copper occurrences out here. Uh, the, the main deposit is another one by being studied by Silver City Minerals called Copper Blow. So I'm, I'm not familiar with every occurrence out there. Okay, now, now I come to a bit of speculation. So here's my model of rifting. And uh, you, 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 can, you can see in this area here, I have a single rift, then, then it's, there's a transfer fault, and then, then there's the rifts, the, the, the axial uh, intrusion splits into two halves. Now I just wonder if that's, that's what's sort of happening in, in, in this area here where the there's been a transfer fault down here. It's just one gravity anomaly. I'd say that's corresponding to this area here. And up north of that has been the rift is split and you've got this V-shape. So the Broken Hill Rift would be spreading uh, down towards the, the southwest. And I, I would put a possible transfer zone across here, which if you look at the geology map, there's a whole lot of cross shears going through here. There's various shears going up in that direction. 
which could correspond to the, these edge, edges of the gravity and all these, uh, the, the outcrop area stops here along a Monday Monday fault, which, which uh, is probably down there. So um, this, this, this is just a very, very primitive model of what could be going on. The whole, the whole system here seems to be cut off by the transfer zone. Now, we come to the inversion and a couple of other things. So this, this is the topography of the Broken Hill area. So, so basically, it, it's high and everything else around it's flat. So basically, my interpretation is that this, this is caused by basal inversion. The original sin rift sediments and other sediments have all been pushed up and there's hardly any post drift because they've been eroded off. Uh, uh, I came across a, a good example of a similar thing. I was working in the Western Desert in Egypt near the El Alamein battlefield, and there's a rip there had been inverted. And on one side, they had a, a low area of impassable sand dunes called the Patara Depression, and on the other side, it had the Mediterranean Sea. So poor old Rommel only had this really thin strip of uh, high ground that he got, could go down. So Montgomery was able to sort of put his put his guns across the line and stop Rommel. Probably nobody needs heard of Rommel. Um, now, the other, the other important thing here, there's a, a Darling Range uh, thrust zone here. Now, uh, the, I'll, I'll, I'll show you a bit, bit, bit more, but um, I did some work for a petroleum company in Brunei and Sarawak, and there was a big anticline there, and there was a, a thrust anticline, and just north of the thrust anticline, there was a big uh, gravity and magnetic anomaly, which was down quite deep, but I modeled it. Now, uh, basically, uh, I think it was due to ophiolites because further along in, in uh, uh, the next country, uh, Ophiolites uh, outcropping. But anyway, what happened when there were offsets in this gravity anomaly, there were offsets in, in this thrust anticline. And the impression I had in Brunei and Sarawak was that uh, the, the, the thrust was sort of bust, buttressed against this, this deep, deep ophiolite. You know, that was the, the thrust was trying to push rock somewhere, but this. This deep magnetic dense body was, was stopping them. So you, you ended up being thrust over it. So here we have the Thorndale composite gneiss, which seems to be, is our crop, it seems to be kind of, uh, this, this is where the gravity anomaly is because you can see where, where the uh, silver lead zinc deposits are, but the, the, the thrust seems to be uh, kind of. Uh, localized by that, that big gravity on it. So I'm, I'm, I'm proposing that there's a bit big dead spot down there, which kind of is controlling the thrust at a shallower level. And well, that, that just shows the uh, Thorndale nice in, in relation to gravity anomaly. It really does seem to be a relation there. And the, the Thorndale nice is, is magnetic. Um, so I, I, I tried to check out seismic work that's been done by Geoscience Australia. I, I, I've done about 10 years of seismic reflection interpretation. And my comments are that seismic reflection doesn't work very well in uh, high grade metamorphic terrains because you don't have the acoustic impedance contrast between uh, the different rock layers. But the acoustic impedance is a combination of density and, and uh, seismic velocity. So that's that's one problem. You don't you, you don't get as many good reflections. Also in very structured areas you, you get all sorts of complications like uh, reflective refractions and side swipe for events that are off the off the line and you also get multiples. So basically, I've had a look at this and 
I, I, I just don't, don't think it's helping the picture at all. And that's, that's an earlier Geoscience Australia interpretation using a, a less uh, powerful seismic system. And I, I just don't believe any of that at all. I'm sorry. So anyway, we're coming to the edge now, the end. The, just a go away with the black stuff. <laughs> so the Cannington silver zinc red deposit in Queensland it is located on the edge of a major gravity anomaly. Uh, the Cannington deposit is magnetic and was drilled because it was magnetic, but I just wonder whether the Cannington gravity anomaly is one of these mid-rift mid uh, intrusions. Uh, Another broken hill lead zinc deposit in South Australia, which uh, may be located on the edge of a major gravity anomaly. I haven't been able to verify that. There's a, a well known Australian geophysicist told me that, but I won't quote his name in case he's wrong. So similarly, uh, zinc grooven zinc lead deposit in Sweden may be located on the edge of a major gravity anomaly. Uh, there's a rip. Nigeria called the Benui uh, Trough, which has a major axial gravity high and has lead zinc deposits in fractures on its flanks. So is, is there a pattern with these type of deposits being related to these uh, midriff intrusions? Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, so the, the question is, can major gravity anomalies similar to those occurring in Broken Hill or Cannington be used as guides as to where to explore for Broken Hill type deposits. I, you know, I, I didn't promise you that I'd tell you where to drill, but I, I, you know, <laughs> no, I just as a choosing an area, uh, it, it's a pretty good guide. So uh, anyway, um, <laughs> Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Has anybody got uh, any questions for Peter? Of course. <laughs> Peter, uh, great presentation. I think I've seen a few of those slides before. Uh, um, the Rift uh, model that you've been using is a very interesting one. My, I would think that broken hill mineralization is roughly sin rift and about 1.6 billion years old. Would that be a comment? Yeah, just a little bit older than that. Just a little bit older. Than that. Now, that rift has had 1.6 billion years of things happening to it uh, burial, structuring, things like that. Would you expect the gravity anomaly to stay intact? that long. It appears that uh, there's a possibility um, that there's an awful lot happened to those rocks. Right? Yeah. Well, well in, in the case of the bone plant, golf, that, those intrusions are pretty, pretty big things and they're kind of joined to the mantle so maybe, <laughs> maybe they want to stay there while everything else is moving. Yeah, oh well, it would need, there would have been crustal scale structures affecting that, mm. that area. So that was more of a, a question. Would you expect it to support the same as it did 1.6 billion years ago? In the gravity? In the gravity, you think so? Well, is that what the question is? Yes, so you think in the gravity. Yeah, I think in the gravity, it's probably not the matter. Just on that question, uh, if you've got really large mafic bodies and you've got deformation going on with say shifts and so on around it's quite possible that the shifts will take up most of the deformation and the big mafic bodies might just stay in one piece while things are going on around them so there is a possibility that they could survive intact even though it modified somewhat so it could be just the density of the mafic bodies that we're seeing so well, it's, it's more or less the, the strength of the rock. Where the chests are made of micas and so on, and they, they deform more easily. Okay. It, it uh, strain localization in deformation zones. Anyway, I've got a few more words about the 
Oh, uh, yeah, look, uh, I think the, the general idea is really interesting. Uh, I've done a bit of work on that big gravity anomaly. I was working with uh, with Vlad David when he worked for the survey. We tried to do some modeling on it. And there was actually a, a drill hole drilled by Triarco 1200 meters into a, a, a bump on the top of that gravity anomaly. So having that the bump was the break of the lower body. And uh, we did a whole lot of SD measurements on it. And then we looked at the map and I, I started drawing cross sections using, so yeah, there's amphibolites on the surface, it's quite a lot. And people are saying, well, maybe the amphibolites uh, cause the gravity anomaly. But what we found was the amphibolites just didn't have enough volume to cause that gravity anomaly. So there's something further down, which might be what you're talking about. It's, it's got to be uh, dense, so it's got to be mopey. And uh, you're probably right, there probably is a big mopey body uh, a few kilometres down. Yeah. We, didn't, we didn't finish the modelling because Glenn left the survey and uh, left me with it. My, my, rough, my rough model has the intrusion down about six kilometres. Six, yeah. If uh, Shiaka had a fair way to go with it, 1200 by the hole. On that particular model, the gravity modeling I, you showed on the Bonaparte uh, basin, uh, that wasn't your model. No, no, that was by Stephanie Ball, which you prepared. The, the depths of sediments there were 20 kilometers. The seismic showed about 10, which somewhere between those two might be, be reasonable, but there was a big discrepancy between the, uh, the, the two. No, I don't think that's the way yeah, it was two-way two time. Two-way time. Oh, two-way time. Yeah, uh, fifteen second. Your eyesight's better. Size. Yeah. <laughs> I'll look at that as well. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question. Uh, the, the scale is compared to what you see in uh, sort of the, the Red Sea Rift or the Bonaparte, is, is it at the same scale in terms of how large the system is? Because there's obviously some constraints on uh, how these sort of things uh, operate. So, I think roughly scale the same. The East African Rift doesn't really broaden out, it just continues narrowing with all these gravity highs down the axis. And in terms of Cancer, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that Cancer is uh, sort of a sin rift. Okay. But, uh, the, uh, like you say, I think the the localization of the rift is quite a long way over to the west. So it's sort of sitting on the edge of the system now. So the uh, uh, with magnetics uh, and the matrix box, when you look at the surface uh, magnetics, you see lots of magnetic uh, anomalies and so on. Most of those anomalies are not amphibolite. Most of the amphibolites have uh, very low magnetite contents. It's been a low oxygen system that's been fractionating, and you only get magnetite right at the end of the fractionation. So mo most of the amphibolites are not magnetic. The magnetite's in other rocks. It's in metasediments, in all sorts of things. So there's no problem having non-magnetic amphibolites. Okay. Well, maybe. If the intrusions are non magnetic, the yeah, amphibolites can be non magnetic as well. Well, could well be, yeah. yeah. The iron goes into the amphibolite. Once you get up into the higher magnetic uh, What was that? Does the iron go into the amphibole once you get up into the higher metamorphic grades? No, uh, the iron was, a lot of the iron was going into uh, ilmenite and that sort of thing. There's high titanium in those, in those rocks too. So well, there's a lot of Fe2 in, in the biotite garnet and so on, but there's not a lot of Fe3 in the system. So uh, the, the amphibolites, when they were dolerite, so crystallizing ilmenite rather than magnetite. Who else for a question? Yeah, I've got a Oh. The question should be coming up here. Yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> Anyone else? Or are we going to let him off that easy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of details I've, I've 
<laughs> Peter, I'll have to ask the obvious question then. Does it just stop there, or, or does or is there a big transfer to the north? No, I've wondered about that. Mm -hmm. some, people, people, some people have questioned where Cannington and Broken Hill were actually connected. So the bottom part of Miles and Broken Hill were connected. So people that seem to be people like that. So is Cannington to the west? Cannington is way, way up to the north, the bottom of the Mount Isaac. So uh, it's it's been displaced a long way, but that's northeast. Um, if I could have everybody to seem, seem to have a forum, I know that there are people stuck in traffic somewhere, but I think we should have. Well, we're doing some of the basic stuff and things like that. Oh, oh. Uh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I, think, I can't remember the exact details of what um, Pete and Joe Jolton and that were saying, but I think it's been I've got two on it's, it's a massive, massive, massive structure. Yeah, you know, like 500 kilometers plus. Yeah. But, and possibly the way that some of the other oh, Sorry, sorry, I, sorry, I took the question. Yeah. No, you did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're quite similar. I've, I've done a lot more work up in the I mean, I work for Broken Hill, but I've done a lot more work in the You know, the, the metabolic grades are very similar. The only thing that I would count in uh, is a lot more complex, just from the sort of medicine level point of view. Similarities, but you got and Bright Hill, or wherever they were connected. Oh, yeah, there's a good chance that the two blocks were connected when you look at the. Um, the shapes of the, uh, the gravity anomalies and so on, they, they look very similar. But there's a big hole in the middle where they look like they've come apart and you've got lots of probably Paleozoic rocks underneath the cover, which we don't know much about. Yeah. It's almost like they were, they were sort of connected like this and then huge structures just sheared Cannington up there. And, and you look at the arrangement of the, the major basins in Eastern Australia and some of the beginning, that's it. Like, there's definitely a good argument for it. You can't have a little bit of that. So so one other thing you mentioned, you mentioned uh, Peter mentioned about Cannington, a rather empirical, I think it's full of magnetite, isn't it? Cannington? It's not really full of either pyritite or magnetite. There's, there's pyritite in it, yeah. but most of it is around the edge of the shoe. Uh, what they call the shoe, which is the siliconite magnetite schist. Um, there's magnetite in it, but it's not, it's not every It's a magnetic anomaly, though, is it? There's a little little magnetic anomaly in the middle of it. Yeah, but it's not it's not a massive magnetic anomaly. It's a, it's a bit, yeah, and Bracken Hill's got virtually no magnetic anomaly. I think the pyritite there is not magnetic. The pyritite in most of those systems is not magnetic. So if you look at um, any of those pyritite systems in the eastern Isaac, pretty pretty much the, the main or is uh, associated with the magnetic pyrotite. You get magnetic pyrotite sometimes in the, um, uh, the wall rocks. On the um, so, yeah. I'm not sure entirely what's controlled. Thanks, Terry. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Sarah. For those of us not privy to Broken Hill, what, what are the implications of this research, uh, like economically uh, or otherwise? Sorry, I didn't quite get the oh, I'll say it again. Um, for those of us that aren't privy with Broken Hill, what are, what are the implications of this research in terms of you know, economic mineralization or you know, drilling down six kilometers to this? No, you wouldn't drill down six kilometers. All, all I'm trying to, to show here is give a possible explanation for Broken Hill and say, if you, if you can identify these types of gravity anomalies, ideally in a rift environment, that that would sort of give you an area to explore. You know, it's just, this talk was never aimed at giving you drilling targets. It's basically look on the edge of big gravity anomalies, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah.
I must admit, I did not. So, so Bert and Hill, was that an example of one of the failed bridges to mention the war that falls down? Yeah, yeah that's, that was the point um, of the talk. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then 